I will rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible says, where there are two or more, the presence of the Lord is. Come on, we're more than two, we're more than three. You carry God, I carry God. Come on, that's it, that's it. Let's begin to pray in the spirit. Let's pray in understanding. And let's just begin to pray as we worship him. As we enter his throne. The Bible says enter his throne with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Come on, come on, that's it. I feel worship in this place. The praise of our God Almighty. The praise of the Most Holy One. The one who sits on the throne on high. The one who is King of Kings. The one who is Lord of Lords. The one who no one can stand. Jehovah Elohim. Our strength. Our strength. Nobody like our God. Nobody like the one who saves you. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of praise. Come and worship. Worship, 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 worship. In this place, in this place, in this place. If all you can do is to sing. If all you can say is thank you. Just begin to say thank you. If all you can say is hallelujah. Just say hallelujah. Because hallelujah is a heavenly language. I feel the spirit of prayer. Sometimes you plan, but as a way God comes to turn things around. Come on, pray, 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 pray. Open your mouth and get a pray. You don't know where your breakthrough is.
church, I want you to sing it.
healing balm. Sometimes you just need to stay in the presence of God and let him refill you. There was something that was done. Hold on, hold on. We had prayer about a week and a half ago or two. Bring it down a bit. And there was something that was practiced there, which is silence in the presence of God. When you've prayed, when you've worshipped, you need to just stay and be quiet. So I just want everybody to close their eyes. Just close your eyes and just breathe. Take away all your fears, all your worries, and touch God. I just want you to focus on God. All the songs that we have sang in worship this morning were songs of a victor saying about how God rescued our lives. Think about how God has rescued your life and that of your family, your children. And that's what I want you to use this silence for. And from inside of you, begin to appreciate God. Just relax in the presence of God. Sometimes we just talk too much. We want to do and do and do. Sometimes when you are in the presence of God, you just need to, after you've prayed and you've worshipped, you just need to stay silent and let the Holy Spirit move. Release that pain. Your shoulders are heavy. Release it. Worries about your children, about your finances. Just breathe. God is there. He said he will never leave nor forsake you. Be assured and reassured in the word and the promises of God. Breathe one more time. It looks like you're lost. Just tell God to fill you up one more time. Tell God to give you strength. If you can pray, start praying. This is another type of worship we're going into. Even if it's just mutterings. Touch God. Touch Him. And breathe. If you need strength, just say, God, give me strength. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. your breath it's your breath everybody it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you
So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, oh. spirit you know what just happened I know that God just touched people this morning I know that I know that amen, amen. hallelujah amen. come on give your neighbor on your left and on your right a smile and a high five a smile and a high five amen give me a shout of hallelujah amen I want to see your hands together. I want to see your hands together. Tell your neighbor, put your hands together like this.
sing a little louder than you. before. Oh, 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 oh. I wanna clap a little louder than before. Oh, 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 oh. I wanna jump a little higher than before. Oh, 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 oh. I wanna jump. I wanna jump a little louder. of life and leadership. It is the season to engage the nations for the cause of the King and His Kingdom. It is the season for new challenges, new achievements, and new levels of productivity. These are the days of His power. These are the days of His grace. These are the days of His majesty. 2023, our year of exploits. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is good and all the time. Hallelujah. Please be seated. You're welcome to the house of God. Hallelujah. And I know that you will be blessed because you came. Hallelujah. You will not go home the same. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says that all the things that are written in the scriptures were written for our learning. So that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so I pray that this morning you have hope. And you are here to receive even more strength. Hallelujah. To run the race that is set before you and I. I want to welcome you to Living Springs International Church. We are... A Bible believing church and God is doing so many great things with us and I am so glad that you can join us this morning to be a partaker of the grace that is upon this house hallelujah in the name of Jesus please bow down your heads with me let us pray eternal father we thank you for such a wonderful time in your presence the Bible declares that in your presence there's fullness of joy and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore and this morning we know that we have come to Mount Zion. We have not come before, my God, ordinary uh, um, settings, but we have come before the throne of grace. This morning we have come before innumerable host of angels to the sprinkling of the blood that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And so we know that, Lord, your grace is available to us in everything that we're going to do this morning. We thank you, we bless you, we ask, oh God, that your word will be like the good seed that fell upon the good soil. 
And I pray that this word will bring forth a harvest 60 fold, 100 fold to the praise and glory of your name. We thank you, we bless you, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Agree with me, let us say together, Amen. Amen. Well, you're welcome this wonderful morning to the house of God again. And last week we were celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to carry on from where we left off. Um, I'm going to go back just a little bit to recap on the things we, we talked about and then we'll take the message um, um, to its conclusion. And the title of the message this morning is Transformed to Save. Hallelujah. Say with me, I am transformed to save. Say it like you mean it, transformed to save. Hallelujah. So let us go back to the scripture in the book of Mark chapter 16. And we want to take the verse number 7. Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 7. Hallelujah. This is the word of the angel to Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, uh, who is the mother of James and Salome, according to Mark's account, who went in and found an empty tomb and found this angel who spoke to them. And this is what he said. said, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Go tell his disciples and Peter. He identifies Peter. Apart from the disciples, he mentions Peter in particular by name. And I've been thinking about this scripture for quite a while. Why Peter? Last Wednesday, was it Wednesday when we had our Bible class? We were talking about, I was talking on the subject of Revelation. And we know in the scriptures that Revelation is so important. Hallelujah. When we come to the realm of Revelation... We are considering things that have been given to us or downloaded into our spirits from above. Now, a revelation is, it could be a surprising and previously unknown fact that has been disclosed to others. That's a revelation. Or it can be the making known of something that was previously secret or unknown. That's a revelation. Or it could be the divine or supernatural disclosure is divine, is supernatural, and it's a disclosure to humans of something relating to human existence that had not been known before. So we understand in the scriptures that in Matthew chapter number 16, from verse number 13, you don't need to go there yet, but I can tell you what happened there. The Bible says that Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. And there he asked them a question, a very personal question. He says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they answered him. They said, some say you are John the Baptist. Obviously, by this time, John the Baptist had been beheaded. He was dead. But they believed that he was John the Baptist come back to life. He says, some say you are Jeremiah. Some say you are Elijah. And others also that you are one of the prophets who's come back. And Jesus narrows the question now to the disciples, and he says to them, but who do you say that I, the son of man, am? And the Bible says, we know Peter, impetuous Peter. He's always the first to open his mouth. But this time, Peter gets it so right. He says to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus commended him and said, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you but by my father who is in heaven. Now, my only worry for Peter is that Peter never bothered to find out now that he had identified who the Christ was. You would have thought that he would also seek from that same means to find out what the duty or what the work of the Christ should be. Because we find out that the next thing is that Jesus now says to him, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'll be delivered up by the chief priests, by the rulers, and I will be condemned to death. I'm paraphrasing. 
and I will be crucified. But on the third day, I will rise from the dead. And Simon Peter, the Bible says, took Jesus aside and rebuked him. Oh, you've caught a revelation that he's a Christ. But you never caught the revelation of what the Christ should do. And so Peter has a problem. And I was saying on Wednesday that when we capture revelation and it's not complete, we endanger our own selves because that half revelation did a lot of harm to him. So now when his master, the Christ, told him what is supposed to happen to the Christ, according to that which was written in scripture, way before they were born, way before the disciples came on the scene, Jesus was declaring that which had been ordained or foreordained which Moses had written about, which the prophets had spoken about, which is written in the book of Psalms. This was not something that was new. It was foreordained. But Peter didn't catch that revelation. And because he didn't catch that revelation, he had a problem with what his master said. He took him. Can you imagine taking Jesus aside, rebuking him sternly, saying, don't say that. These people are following us, and you're going to discourage them by these words you're saying. You're not going to go to Jerusalem. You're not going to die. You're not going to rise up from any cross. These are not right things that you should be saying. So here he was one minute. He was coming out with revelation. Next minute, he was now speaking out of the flesh. And do you think, I've been asking myself, why was Peter acting like that? Then it dawned on me that all these disciples, when you read the scriptures, they were hoping that Jesus will be a physical a Messiah who would come and take over the reins of authority in Israel because then they were under Roman occupation. So this ruler, who is supernatural, he can give you bread when you're hungry, can multiply bread for you, he can walk on water, he can do all kinds of stuff. And Peter and his disciples, look at James and John, they were vying for positions. In an earthly kingdom, they were looking forward to a government on earth where they, as disciples who have left everything to follow Jesus, will be rewarded by giving them positions. How wrong they were. In the, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 3, I think verse number 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Peter was leaning upon his own understanding. So he was okay with revelation as to this man being the Christ. But as to what the Christ was to do, he wasn't interested. Because in his mind, he already had it all sorted out. We are going to go to Jerusalem and take over. And we are going to take positions of authority and power. May that not be our portion. And I pray that all of us will hunger for revelation for the right reasons. Because revelation changes your perspective. It changes everything about you. It changes everything about your life. So I've been asking myself now, because of this mindset that they had, when they received the news from the women that the empty tomb was, not the empty tomb, but when they received the news that the tomb was empty, I should say, they, they couldn't process the news well. I, I've been going through the scriptures and I've been asking myself, what, what was the response of the various people that we see in this story to the empty tomb. First, we see Mary Magdalene and his colleagues, and her colleagues, I beg your pardon. And the Bible says that they run out of the tomb in fear, but with great joy. I love that. Not with any suspicion, not with unbelief, not with distrust or any other, you know, thing, but they run out with great joy, but in fear. They trembled, they marveled at what they had seen, but they were at least joyful. Then they went to tell the disciples who were huddled in a place for fear of the Jews. And the Bible tells me that when the disciples heard them, guess what? They did not believe. Why? Because it didn't fit into their revelation of Christ. It didn't fit into what they had in their minds. They didn't believe them. They were there weeping. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16 verse 10, the disciples were in a place mourning and weeping. And then they hear this news and you think they'll be joyful and they'll start celebrating. No. In fact, in Luke's account, Luke chapter 16, verse 11, the Bible says, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by Mary Magdalene, they did not believe. Luke chapter number 24, 11. It says, the words of the women, when these women came, 
to give them the news that should have lifted them up from their mourning and their the, the distress. Guess what? The Bible says the very words of the women seem to them like idle tales. These women are just idlers. They're just talking something. They don't know what they're talking about. And when something is idle, it simply means it is without purpose. It is of no effect. It is pointless. So they thought what the women were saying about the resurrection was without purpose. It was without effect. It was pointless. There was no sense to it. Why? Because of the theology that they had. They had in their own heads. Nothing made sense. And the Bible says, and they did not believe these women. Luke 24, 12 tells me that but Peter, say with me, but Peter. I'm not surprised Jesus singled out Peter when he sent the message to go and call the disciples or tell them. He says, tell the disciples and Peter. The Bible says, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb. And stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling, filled with wonder and astonishment. That's what it means to marvel. He was filled with wonder and astonishment to himself. He marveled to himself at what had happened. Hallelujah. Amen. Then there were two other disciples. The Bible tells us that they also saw the resurrected Christ. They were going to a place called Emmaus. And Emmaus was a village that was about seven miles northwest of, of, of Jerusalem. And the Bible says as they were walking, Jesus drew near and joined them on this journey. And they were talking, the two of them. The name of one is Cleopas. Now, when you read the scriptures in, I think, John chapter 19, 25, um, at the cross, we see a Mary, the wife of Cleopas. So I don't know whether it's the same Cleopas. The spelling is a bit different. It's different. There's an E there. But this man is called Cleopas. And the Bible says he's walking with a companion. I don't know. Maybe it could have been his wife because she also was a believer. And at the cross, they were the believers who were there. John was there. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was there. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, also was there. All the disciples were nowhere to be found apart from John. So the Bible says they were walking towards Emmaus. And Jesus drew near to them and asked them a question. He says, what are you talking about? And why are you sad? What, what is going on? Why, what are you discussing even among yourselves? And Clopas has a, a lip. He says to Jesus, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Are you the only stranger who doesn't know the events that have unfolded in these last three days? And Jesus said, no, tell me. So, and by this time, their eyes, the Bible says, I love Mark's account. I love all the accounts, but this one is interesting. The Bible says that their eyes had been restrained. Their eyes had been covered, veiled. They didn't see who it was they were talking to. So Jesus wanted to provoke them to find more. So what is happening? He said, oh, a man called Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet from God, a man of great works and great deeds and great word, a man attested by God himself and before all of Israel. He says, this man has been condemned and delivered to death and they crucified him on the cross but three days later one of the women from our company went to the tomb and she came back and said he's risen he's not dead actually one of them said she actually saw him that he is alive ha huh. jesus looked at them and i want us to read what jesus said to them Come with me to the book of Luke, please. Chapter 24. Luke chapter number 24. And we want to read from verse number 25. Luke 24 and verse 25. Hallelujah. Jesus said to them, Oh, foolish ones. So we are foolish when we have no revelation. It's foolishness. It says, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe. I like that. 
Sometimes we, we all of us, we are slow of heart. <laughs> slow of heart to believe. In all that the prophets have spoken. And Jesus says to them, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So they didn't know that. That for Jesus to enter into his glory, he had to go through suffering. The suffering will be the rejection, the condemnation to death, the crucifixion, such a cruel crucifixion, and then death, then the resurrection, and then after his resurrection, he will enter into his glory. That is what was written about him. But because they didn't know it, they were saddened, and they were confused, and didn't understand what was going on. And the Bible says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded. In other words, Jesus began to present and to explain in detail his own mission. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Which tells me that the things concerning himself were already in the scriptures. It's just that they didn't know it. So all their motions they were going through were needless. Many times we go through needless pain because we don't even know what is written in the scriptures. What does the Bible say to us in the book of Hosea? It says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Because of our lack of knowledge concerning so many things, we go through needless pain. And here the disciples were going through all this because they didn't know. So the story continues. As they journeyed, they got to their destination. They got to a mouse. And the Bible says that these two disciples, they implored Jesus. And they said, look, it's late. It's evening. And why don't you come with us and come and spend the night with us? And then you carry on tomorrow. So he obliged. He accepted the invitation. He accepted their hospitality. Then he went with them. They sat down. They prepared a meal. He sat down, watched them prepare it. They brought the food. As soon as they brought the food, then he took over. Can you imagine a host coming to your house and you are going to serve them the food and then they sit back and they take the food and they bless it and they break it and then they give it to you. Immediately, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. The Bible says their eyes opened and they realized that it is Jesus. The one they've been talking along when they were journeying all the way seven miles, yap, 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 they never for one minute realized that it was the Lord. Their eyes opened. Who? And the Bible says immediately he vanished from their sight. Ah. Then I wonder what they would have said. The Bible tells us what they said. They looked at one and they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke the word of God to us? I've had that sensation one time, and I'll never forget it. And it was with Bishop. I told him. I went to visit him in a hotel. He was in London, and he was sharing scripture with me. And that day, I don't know where the thing came from, but the scripture he shared with me, I, I had this sensation in my heart. And it amazed me. Question that I want to ask is, when we read the word, how do we feel? Because when you read the word, that's Jesus talking to you. That's the word of God. Do we just brush through what we are reading and just get up and carry on because we did it in a haste? We are so often in a hurry. We are so often in a haste that we don't enjoy what he's trying to say to us. He said, I, did, did our hearts not burn within us when he spoke the word to us? So guess what they decided to do? They decided to go back. And it's interesting. Now, here were people who were saying to Jesus, look, it's late. It's late evening. Don't journey anymore. Stay here. Now when they caught the revelation that, hey, we've been walking with Jesus Christ all this seven-mile journey, they decided that they're going to go back to Jerusalem to go and share the news. They didn't care even anymore that it was night. They didn't care anymore. If only they had a mobile phone. They could have just sent a text message to Jerusalem and to Peter and the guy and say, look, we've seen the guy. So they journeyed, they walked all the way to Jerusalem. Guess what? The Bible says when they got to the place and they were telling them the story of how Jesus walked with them, they did not believe them. Ah. 
But something interesting happened. Verse number 36 of the same chapter, Luke 24. Now, as they said these things, so as they were telling them, and the unbelief was there, the disciples didn't believe them. They didn't believe them. That account is in the book of Mark. I think it's in Mark chapter number 16 again. It tells you that the disciples did not believe them. But here, the Bible says, now, as they said these things, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. Hey, so now, <laughs> he shows himself to the disciples in that place. And guess what he says to them? He says, let's first thing. The Bible says, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. So all this resurrection stuff, it didn't still register. It didn't make any sense to them. Lack of revelation didn't make any sense. Absolutely. They were terrified. They thought they had seen a ghost. They thought they had seen a spirit. These are the disciples. And the Bible says, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why, do you, why does doubt or why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So now he wants them to know that, listen, this body is not just some, 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 some imagination. It's not a spirit. A spirit cannot eat and drink. Hallelujah. This tells us that Jesus rose from the dead. And he showed himself alive. They could touch him. They could feel him. He said, feel my hands and feel my feet. The imprints of the nails, feel them for you to believe if that's what you need. Now, I like the account in John. Come with me to John chapter number 20. Now, I'll be looking at John 20 and 21 because that's where the focus of my message today is. John chapter 20 tells us that on this occasion in John's account, when, they went, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, the Bible says it was the doors were locked. And they were huddled in there for fear of the Jews. And Jesus comes through, which means the resurrected body of Jesus could go through doors. And yet he was very physical. You could touch him, you could feel him. And that is the sort of body I believe that in the resurrection we are going to have. It's a body that doesn't make sense. It defies physics. He walks through the door and he stands before them and they panicked. And the Bible says that Jesus... Showed them his hands again. And showed them his feet. I want to read from verse number 19 of John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came in and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace with you, or peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Hallelujah. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. I want you to mark this scripture. It's crucial. Because he commissions them. He says, I've given you a commission now. As the Father sent me, now I'm also sending you. To send the message of the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's your duty now. I've done my bit. Now it's your duty to carry the message forward. As the Father sent me, hallelujah, I also send you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Wow. Now, somebody may ask, but what about Pentecost? I believe this was just a foretaste of what they were about to receive at Pentecost. The fullness of the Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. Then Thomas, the Bible says, called the twin or Didamus. The Bible says, he being one of the twelve, was not with them. And when Jesus came, the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in, the, in, in his hands the print of the nails 
and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I was saying during the week that unbelief is an act of the will. You may have all the evidence, but choose not to believe. Because he has his own mindset. He says, no, I will not believe. And I was asking on Wednesday when we had a Bible class. I said, he had the testimony. John uh, Thomas had a testimony of the angel. The angel who stood and told them, told Mary to go tell the disciples, this is an angel of God who came from heaven just to come and give you that information. So, Thomas, you're saying you don't believe the angel. Okay. What about the testimony of even these two disciples who walked with him all the way to Emmaus? Thomas still doesn't believe. What about his own friends, Peter, James, John, the other disciples, who told him the first time Jesus came that he's risen from the dead? Thomas said, I will not believe. And it wasn't because of a lack of evidence. He had made up his mind that unless I see. During the week, I was looking at the word that I came across, incredulity. It is an unwillingness or an inability to believe it starts with an unwillingness unbelief starts with unwillingness and then it becomes inability now you're not able to believe incredulity he, they just couldn't receive what they were being told and thomas says i will never believe until i feel until i touch so guess what the bible says eight days later oh what a wonderful god we serve jesus came to the same place the same scenario all the disciples, this time including Thomas. And he goes straight to Thomas. He says, Thomas, feel. You wanted to feel, right? Feel my hands. Feel the imprints of the nails. My feet. Check it out. My side. Put your hand there as you wanted to do. And now Thomas says, my Lord and my God. The pendulum has swung 180 degrees. From unbelief and doubt and talking who are now, he says, he's not just my God, he's my Lord. Hallelujah. And Jesus says to him, Thomas, do you now believe because you have seen? But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Hallelujah. When you look at the Amplified, he says, blessed means happy. Hallelujah. Spiritually secure. Favored by God are those who have not seen and yet believe. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't need to see the physical evidence. The evidence that we have is the truth of God's word. And you and I can choose to believe God's word and say, yes, the word of God is enough evidence. Faith, substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things that our physical eyes have not seen. But there's something that is more assuring than our physical eyes. It's not every time that we have to see before we believe. But rather, believing is seeing. When you believe, you will see. It's not seeing that is believing. But rather, it's believing that is seeing. Hallelujah. Now, this man is full of faith. He says, my Lord and my God. And that leads me on to chapter number 21, which is where I want to focus for the rest of this message. After these things, what things? After Jesus had showed himself to the disciples, at least on two occasions. The first time with Thomas, without Thomas, the second time with Thomas. And then he had showed himself to so many people also in Jerusalem. But he said to them, go to Galilee. Tell the disciples to go to Galilee and there I will see them. So now we see the disciples in Galilee. By the Sea of Tiberias. When you go to Israel, you realize that the sea, the, the lake, the, what's it, um, the Sea of Galilee is the same Sea of Tiberias. It's also known as Lake Gennesaret. And what I, we, the, the, our tour guide explained to us was the writers of the Bible would call it by such a name based on which side of the lake they were at. So when they are at the side of Tiberias, which is by the lake, then they called it the Sea of Tiberias. When they were in Galilee, or, you know, they saw Galilee. When they were maybe by Gennesaret, they would call it the Lake Gennesaret. And then also the Sea of Galilee. So it's the same body of water. It's the same body of water. So now, the Bible says, Peter, 
<laughs> Simon Peter, Thomas, who is called the twin, or Didamus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. Now, remember Nathaniel. This is the guy that Jesus saw him, and Nathaniel, I think, was introduced to Jesus by Philip, his friend. And Philip says, we found the Messiah, the one whom the prophet spoke about, Moses spoke about. We found the guy. And Nathaniel looks at him and says, where is he? He says, oh, he's Jesus of Nazareth. He says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything proper, any decent thing come from? Because Nazareth in those days was quite notorious. Can anything come from Nazareth? So they went to check this man out. The Bible says when he came, Jesus said, hey, Nathaniel, a, a proper Israelite in whom there is no guile, there is no deceit in this guy. He just says it as it is. As it is. And Nathaniel says, where do you know me? And Jesus said, when you were under the fig tree, I was saying here on Friday, we don't know what he was doing under the fig tree. He probably was doing number two, I don't know. But he was doing something ridiculous. The Bible says, Jesus said, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And immediately, he said, oh, you are the Messiah. <laughs> it's amazing how we believe people when they can tell us where we're coming from. He says, you are the Messiah. This is Nathaniel, the same Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. And the two sons of Zebedee, of course, we know the two sons of Zebedee are who? John and James. John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he's the author of this book, John. So we've got Simon Peter. Please pay attention. We've got Thomas. We've got um, Nathaniel. We've got the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and then two other disciples whose names are not mentioned. Some Bible scholars believe that the other two were Philip and Andrew, because you know Andrew is Peter's brother, so they probably moved together. So picture the scene. Christ has been raised from the dead. They've seen him. At least the disciples saw him twice in Jerusalem. Now they are in Tiberias. And guess what Peter says? Peter says to the people that he is with, these disciples, I am going fishing. When I, I stood here and I heard them sing, I'm never going back. I said, Lord, thank you for this word. I know I'm speaking to the right people. Peter. Peter who walked with Jesus on water. Peter who saw miracles. Five loaves of bread. Two fish. Broken, blessed. Enough to feed over 5,000 men. Don't even mention the women and the children. Peter seeing miracles. The dead raised to life. But now he's disillusioned and he's distressed because he can't figure out what is happening. And some will say, but he still has to do a job. After all, the Messiah who would send them to go and catch a fish and open the mouth of the fish and take a silver coin from the mouth of the fish, he's no longer there. And they need to pay their bills. We're not the only ones who need to pay our bills. They also had to pay their bills. So the question is, was Peter right to go back to fishing? But they had just been commissioned. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, sent me, I am sending you. Breathed upon them. Receive the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. They received divine enablement to do the thing, but they, they still just went back. I pray that that will not be our story. Because God is counting on us. On every one of us who has been born again, who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter, that day, said, I am going back. May we not go back to where we've come from. Because there's nothing to go back to. A life of drugs, alcohol, women. What kind of lifestyles did we have? And what did we get from it? And now that we've known him, why should we want to go back to that life? We are not going back. Peter said, I am going back to the life that I know, to my occupation, to the life that I'm comfortable with. I'm going fishing. And guess what? The other disciples, six others, Join him. Now you realize that fishermen are very focused people. It's not easy being on water. Hallelujah. 
We were in Italy the other day and we were blessed. Our tour guide had arranged for us to go on water. We went to this little boat. And me, where I come from, there's no water where I come from in my native Ghana. The particular place I come from, there's no, there's no water. <laughs> so when I come to the sea and water, I'm a bit nervous. And we, we sat in this boat and this guy was just having fun. Took us to the middle. There's a, in a, I think it's a place called Gada. And it's a massive lake. It takes seven hours to go across. Yes, massive. Yes, in Verona. And we sat in the boat and he took us into the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and he switched off the boat. And I said, what am I doing here? <laughs> hey, Lord have mercy. And the thing is just bobbing up and down like this. And he was getting a thrill out of it when he saw the, our faces and how scared we were. Imagine being on some little flimsy boat in the middle of, fishermen are very, very courageous people. They're bold, they're brave, focused. They know how to work together as a team because while out there in the, in the middle of nowhere, you need to work together as a team. So guess what? These, and isn't it amazing? Have you ever wondered why at least seven of the people Jesus called in, among his disciples, seven of them were fishermen? What is it about fishermen that Jesus loved? There's something about them. Their commitment, their character, their determination, focus, all these qualities are in a fisherman. And the Bible says that Jesus, now these seven, seven, and by this time Judas is he's killed himself, right? After betraying his master. So there are 11 disciples left. And seven out of the 11, that's the majority. They are all going back fishing. So all that Jesus did with them has been a waste of time. The plans that Jesus has for Simon Peter, everything is going downhill because they cannot understand what is happening. They cannot process it. May that not be our story. Yeah. Hallelujah. He says, I'm going back. <laughs> I'm going back. Guess what? The other six said, we are coming with you. Ooh. Sometimes I think of somebody, everything will say, where I go? Peter, where I go? And he's going to say, me, I go fish. Well, I don't know how they'll say it, but I'm going fishing. And they all followed him. Beloved, when we sit in a place of leadership, we must be careful the words we speak. Because the words we speak have the ability to drag people along with us. Never forget that. What we speak matters. And the words that Peter spoke dragged six others with him and they went jumped on the boat and went fishing but i love this god we serve he has a sense of humor do you know what happened that night the bible says that night they toiled and they caught nothing hmm. look at verse number three of John chapter 20. Peter therefore went out and the other disciples and were, no, I'm not reading the right place. 21. I'm also looking at 20. 21. <clears throat> Please pardon me. So Peter says, I'm going fishing. Okay, from verse number three. We are going with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night, Caught nothing. That night they caught what? Nothing. Say it like you mean it. That night they caught what? Nothing. When God has his hand upon you, you need to be careful how you live your life. You can't live your life doing anything anyhow. Especially when he has a purpose and a plan for you. Peter and his friends, they caught nothing. And I'm thinking of that night in Luke chapter number 5. That day when he called them. Luke chapter number 5 tells us that that day he borrowed Peter's boat to speak to the people that were on the shore. And after he had spoken and used the boat, he asked Peter to launch out into the deep and to let down his nets for a catch. Luke chapter 5. And Peter says, Master, sir, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, 
So they went further, they let down their nets, and they got a catch. They couldn't even lift it. That scripture is interesting because Jesus said, let down your nets. And they only let down their net. No longer, no wonder, I beg your pardon, that when they caught so much fish, they couldn't lift it because the fish was too much for their net. Same thing here. The resurrected Christ is watching them from the shore as they toil aimlessly. Aimless toil. Fruitless toil. Sometimes when our toil is fruitless, it must be a sign that maybe this is not the purpose of God for me. You need to question yourself sometimes. Is this the plan of God? Because God has plans for Peter. Peter will be so dominant in the book of Acts. In the first 12 chapters of Acts, Peter is a central figure. Peter even raised the dead back to life. When Dorcas died, Peter was the one who went and lifted Dorcas back to her feet. Peter will stand before the religious leaders and tell them that Jesus, the one whom God sent, you are the ones who murdered him and who killed him. Peter will stand and do wonders. Raise up a cripple by the gate, beautiful. Peter, he will do all these things. And now, because he didn't know who he was, he's gone back fishing. And whilst he's busy fishing, the whole night he catches nothing. Absolutely nothing. Ha! Huh. And the Bible says, Jesus Christ is at the show. The resurrected Christ. And he's watching them. The Bible says, Jesus stood on the shore. Verse number four. Yet the disciples did not know him. They did not know that it was Jesus. They also had their eyes restrained. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? Another translation says, he said to them, you didn't catch anything, did you? I love that translation more. He says, you haven't caught anything, have you? And we will not catch anything because, listen, it is God who directs us and makes us fruitful. Hallelujah. He says in his word to us. He doesn't, he doesn't hide it. Let's look at what he says in the book of um, is it Luke. No, no, look, John. John chapter 15. Just go back a few pages to John chapter 15. And verse number 1 to 5. Jesus says from verse number 1 or 15, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Ouch. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which, is, which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now get verse number five. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Hallelujah. Without Jesus Christ, we can do what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We are not able to do anything without Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Can I hear better? Amen. Amen. Without him, we can do nothing. <laughs> hey. But these guys, they've had their hope deferred. Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So there were sick people going back to the boat and going to sea. They were doing it out of, I don't know, maybe just a desperation. So there they are, and Jesus is asking them, you haven't caught anything, have you? And I'm sure they were quite embarrassed to say to him, no. And they didn't even know that it was Jesus. Ah. Then he says to them, interesting. I, I, like, I like these scriptures. Jesus said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now, in Luke's account, he said to them, launch a bit further into the deep. But here, in this second instance, Jesus says to them, right where you are, cast the net on the right side of the boat. In other words, all the time that they were struggling the whole night, there was fish on the right side. But how is it that the fish don't swim to this? It's not a very big boat. So the fish must be swimming. But it's not even the fact that there was fish already there. It was by his word. When he spoke his word, he made provision. When he speaks, he makes a way. He said, 
You've been toiling all night. You caught nothing. Right where you are, by my word, cast the net on the right side of the ship. And the Bible says they caught fish. People that have toiled the whole night. May Almighty God cause us not to toil needlessly. Sometimes we toil needless toil. Because we won't even sit down to listen to what God is saying to us. And we run and do stuff on our own only to find out that it's been a waste of our time. You know how much fish they caught? It tells us in the Bible here, 153. I've been asking God, searching the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, what is the significance of that number? Because I'm sure that must stand for something. 153 large fish. Not small, not Ketar school boys, not some rascal fish. No, large fish. For those of you who don't know Ketar school boys, my part of Ghana, where I come from, there's some really sensational, <laughs> interesting fish. They're so small. But these were large fish. Listen, when we heed him, hallelujah, and we obey him, he knows where the good, the good stuff is. He knows how to bring our toil to an end. Hallelujah. He knows all these things. What a wonderful God we serve. Large fish. And yet their nets did not break. All of our efforts in life, they are useless apart from his direction and his blessing. And God is the one who helps us, even when it comes to fishing for souls. Because remember, these were people that he has sent to go and be fishers of men. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What business are they doing on sea? Do you catch men on sea? No. They wanted to go back to fish and catch more fish. Jesus said, uh-uh, tonight you're not going to catch anything. So they came back empty-handed. I want to read on for the sake of time. So the Bible says now they were not able to draw the nets back because of the multitude of fish. How, how wonderful. One minute you have been toiling all night and it looks like you're going home with nothing. Next minute you meet this man. He speaks a word and you have fish that you can't even carry. They had an abundance. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. I love that. John. And John loved Jesus. I said to you that in John chapter 19, 25, he was there by the cross when Peter had denied his master and fled for cover. John stood there. John had leaned on the breast of Jesus. He called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. I like John. He, he doesn't wait for anybody to define him. He defines himself. He says, I am the disciple that, among you guys, I am the disciple that he loves. And Jesus never rebuked him. Jesus never said, no, John, I love you all equally. No, Jesus just watched him. Do you know that John was the last of the disciples to, to die? It is said that they took him to the Isle of Patmos, where he got the book of Revelation. He's the one who wrote the book of Revelation. John, the same John, the apostle Jesus loved. And they put him in hot oil to fry him. He wouldn't die. He survived it. There was rumor, later when we read if time permits us, because of something Jesus said to Peter about John, that, you know, what business of it is yours, of it is yours if I decide that he will stay till I come. So people had this rumor going around that John would never die. Eventually he died. But John was just amazing. But let's go back to Peter. So now Peter hears that it is the Lord. And sometimes it is our love that identifies him to us. When we love him, we are able to see him at work and we're able to tell others about him because we love him. It is the love we have for Christ that allows us even to tell others about the love of God. When you don't love him, evangelism is not part of your... No, you, you, don't, you don't have time for evangelism. Me, no, 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 I don't have time. But when you love him. So now, John loves the Lord. And he could tell. He could see. He said, that's the Lord. That's Jesus. Simon Peter, as always, impulsive. The Bible says he had taken... You know fishermen, he had taken off his top. And as soon as he heard that it is the Lord, he put his garment on and he dived into the water. Question that I asked Peter is, where are, you, where are you going? Are you diving to hide from your master? Or are you diving in haste to get to him at the shore? I don't know. Some believe that he wanted to get to the shore first to see his master. But I don't know that. He dived into the water. Eventually, they came and they dragged their catch. And they came and guess what they found? Verse number nine. As soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals right there. 
and fish laid on it and bread. Look, Jesus, God knows how to make provision for you and I. I I'm asking myself, where did Jesus get the fish from? He is Lord. Probably commanded the fish and they came out of the water. By the time they had toiled fruitlessly in disobedience, I'm going back fishing, toiling and weeks. They came back with nothing. Jesus is standing there and there's already fish. There's provision for somebody here this morning. I'm telling you, if only you can just sort yourself out. He's able to make a way where there is no way. Provision, fish, and bread. Ooh. And a, a coal of fire for them to cook their food. Simon, <laughs> Simon Peter went and dragged the, the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Hallelujah. When we obey him, our nets will not break. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? 153 large fish and the nets were intact. They were not broken. What a wonderful God we serve. Hallelujah. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Some of the accounts in the Bible tells me that the resurrected Christ didn't look exactly the same. When you look in the scriptures, some of at least the two scriptures that makes you see that he didn't, because they would have recognized him physically. They've worked with him all these years. For two, three years, they've been with him. So he didn't look the same. But you could identify him by his mannerism. The, the, the disciples at Emmaus, when he blessed the bread and broke it, they recognized him. So John knows his master. He loves him and he identifies him and he says, it is the Lord. They sat down, they ate. The Bible says, they did not ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Something within them told them that it is the Lord. And I'm sure perhaps they spotted on his hands the imprints of the nail also. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is how, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Can I hear you say amen? amen? So three times he showed himself. Hallelujah. The third time he showed himself alive to the disciples. Hallelujah. Then now Jesus comes, and this is the crux of my message. Peter denied his master. And you and I know the story too well. Three times he denied him. And now for Peter to get back to business, and to focus on the reason for which God called him as a fisherman. To become a follower. And to be who he has been ordained to become. Peter now has to be restored. Because there's a cloud of guilt hanging around Peter. He remembers how on that day he had sworn and said, even if these other disciples, these funny looking guys, if they, if they deny you and they walk away, me, I'll follow you even to death. He said that, that day in Caesarea Philippi, in Matthew 16. He said, I'll follow you to death. But when push came to shove, he took a little slave girl to look at him and say, ah, you are one of the people that hang around him. Jesus said, me, well, not Jesus, uh, Peter said, me? Hey, I don't know this man. Never seen him before. Ah. Then the other people said, but your accent. You are a Galilean. And Galileans had a very typical accent. Your accent gives you away. Suddenly, Peter changed his accent. You are laughing, but it sounds like you and I. We go to places where we change our accent so that we can fit into those environments. It's just like you and I. Change his accent. Why I say? I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 he changed his accent. Then he's warming his hands by a strange fire. It's a cold night. And the soldiers, they are still curious. You are one of them. He says, no, I've never seen this man in my life. I don't know him. And suddenly, the cock crowed. 
One account says Jesus lifted his eyes and looked at Peter. Oh my God. And he's carrying this weight. No wonder he decided to go fishing. The whole thing has been a mess. It's been a disaster. I'm going back fishing. I'm going back to the life I knew. But God's hand was upon him. I'm speaking to somebody this morning. God's hand is upon you. And you know it. You know, you don't need anybody to tell you. You know that his hand is upon you. But you've gone through challenges. You've gone through difficult days and times where you've even questioned the hand of God upon your life. But he that called you is faithful. I want to say to you that he will make a way. Amen. Hallelujah. We just need to realign ourselves with him. Peter needed to be brought back into alignment. And Jesus knew exactly what to do. So he called him. He says, Peter, I need to speak with you. First question he asks him. Now, when you look at chapter number 21, verse 15, the subheading is Jesus restores Peter. So when he had eaten the breakfast, Jesus is such a wonderful guy. He first waits for him to eat, have some food in his stomach. The guy has been sailing all night, caught nothing, had no hope of any food. He gives him food to eat. Now his belly is full. He says, now nah, I need to talk to you, Simon. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Hey, I don't know what the these are, but I can be thinking of the boat, <laughs> the, the fishing nets. Because as long as he has those things, he's tempted to go back to sea. Peter, do you love me more than these things? When you read in the, in the, in the Greek, it is the word agape. Agape is volitional, self-sacrificial love. That's how Jesus was asking him. Do you agape me? The answer Peter gives to him is interesting. He says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. That word love there, you know in the Greek, the, love, the word love has four meanings, right? That same love can mean agape, which is this self-sacrificial love, volitional love. The word love can mean also eros, which is for the romantics, erotic eros. Then the storgy, which is the love that is in the family, you know, in the family setup, and then there is filio, which is brotherly love. And guess the answer Peter gives. Peter gives the answer and he says, I filio you. Jesus asks him again, Peter. First he says, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Then he says to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Again, same agape. Do you agape me, Peter? And Peter says, Lord, I feel you. you. <laughs> Brotherly love, I have affection for you. Brotherly feelings. But Jesus is trying to get to a point. He says, tend my sheep. Third time, Peter or Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? This time, Jesus uses the word, Feel you. Peter, do you feel me? In other words, Jesus is asking him, Peter, do you really love me at all? Do you really have any affection for me? Do you love me? Because this work, if you don't have the love of God, you can't do it. Do you have love for me? One translation says, he says to Peter, are you even my friend? Peter, are you my friend? Do you love me? And by this time, Peter is getting broken. You know, Jesus will not hurry and ask you one question and walk away. He will get to the detail. He will get to the nitty-gritty of it three times. And they tell us that it was three because he had denied his master three times. And he had to be restored in the similar way. So three times he asked him. And finally, Peter says, the Bible says, he grieved. Peter was grieved. Because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now he's got him where he wants him. Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you gathered yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will get, will get you and carry you where you do not wish. It tells us that 
Jesus was talking about the manner in which Peter would die. That's what this thing is about. And I don't know whether you've read this, but do you know how Peter died? Peter also was crucified at the end of his life, just like his master. But Peter refused to be crucified upside, uh, the same way Jesus was crucified. Peter asked that they turn him for his head to be down and his legs to be up. And they crucified Peter with his head down on the cross because he said he was not worthy to die the same way that his master died. My God. This guy had come full circle. But I'm looking at Peter and I look at the things that Peter was able to accomplish. And it was all because he was restored. Hallelujah. Getting ready to finish. Peter was restored. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So Peter had repented. Hallelujah. Repentance has a place in our lives. He repented. And now he was working. Or he was willing now to commit his life to Jesus. The NIV study Bible says, Peter's life changed when he finally realized who Jesus was. That he was not just a leader who had come to lead in an insurrection and restore Israel to his glory from the Romans. No, he realized who Jesus actually was. Number two, when he, his life changed, his occupation also changed. Now he was no longer eager to go back to sea, but he embraced his new occupation as a devoted evangelist, as a fisher of men. Number three, when Peter now repented and his life changed and he changed occupation, his identity also changed. We know how Peter was very impulsive. Impulsive, somebody was very vehement and he was very passionate, but he was very impulsive. Impetuous, that's the word. And he changed and now he lived his name as a rock. Hallelujah. And then his relationship to Jesus also changed because he knew that he was forgiven. And repentance must lead to change. Hallelujah. Repentance must lead to change in character, in life, in attitudes, and in our service to God. Hallelujah. I want to bring this to a conclusion. The Bible says that it was necessary for Jesus to go through the suffering that he went through. Luke chapter 24, 46 to 48. And to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you and I have been called, hallelujah, to be witnesses of these things. Hallelujah. God has highly exalted him to his right hand to be the prince and the savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance is to turn from our sinful life and to change one's mind. It is sincere regret or remorse for our actions. It is to feel regret or contrition. And what is remission? Remission is a cancellation of debt, charge, or penalty. So in him, our debts have been canceled. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen? Our debts have been canceled, and the penalty has been taken away. Hallelujah. And you and I are free of any charge that is against us. Like Peter. God has a good and perfect plan for all of us. Hallelujah. God has a perfect plan, a pleasing plan, a wonderful plan for your life. Peter would have gone back to sea. He would never have realized what wonderful plans Jesus had for him. And regardless of our past failures, he's able to restore us according to his word. But we need to be transformed. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says to us, that we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we may be able to prove what is that good, perfect, acceptable will of God for our lives. This morning, I want to say to somebody who's listening to me that God has a good, perfect, acceptable plan for your life. But it will take you to change your mind. You need to be transformed. And it comes by the renewing of your mind. Peter had his mind renewed. He had to change his mindset that I'm not just a fisherman anymore. Divinity laid hands upon me. He took me from following the fish, and now this is my position. I'm an evangelist. I'm a fisher of men. 
One day he will stand and preach and over 3,000 will believe him. A former fisherman. Next week we will look at the lives of these men and how Pentecost transformed their lives such that the leaders marveled and they looked at them and said, these are fishermen who have never studied. They've never read any books. They never went to any universities, but they spoke the word of God with passion, with fire. And the leaders looked at them and they marveled when they realized that these men had been with Jesus Christ. What change has come over your life since you came into the knowledge of Christ? What difference can people see in your life since you got to know Jesus Christ? The disciples, their lives were transformed because they made up their mind. Hallelujah. Today, our society is very wishy-washy. And we cannot conform to the values of the world. Romans chapter number 12, I want to read from verse number 2 in the Amplified. Do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values. Today, the values of the world are superficial, just surface things. They're not deep. They're not inward. Just on the outside, tingling and messing with things. Yesterday, I was listening to the news, and they were saying that it was during Theresa May's time in government that she promoted all this agenda about children being gender neutral. And I said, ah, this woman really messed up. And now, until I think yesterday when I was listening, the schools were not even telling parents when the children came and said, I believe I'm in a different body. I, I don't believe that I'm, I'm, I should be a boy or a girl. They kept that information away from their parents. Are the teachers saying they care more about their children than their own parents? Today in America, somebody who is 16, in certain states, when you are 16, you can't drink. Even 18, some states you can't drink when you are 18, you can't buy alcohol. There are even some states where you have to be 21 before you can buy liquor. And yet, before you are 16, maybe 10 or less, you can still go and tell somebody or your teacher that, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in the right body. And excuse the crudeness of my language. They will go and take your testicles and cut your breasts off. When you cannot even be permitted to drink. So they're saying it's okay for you not to drink at 16. But at 5, at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it's okay for them to go and carry an operation on you. And change your gender. This is the world we're living in. And he says superficial values let's not conform to them listening to a woman somebody somebody sent me a, a recording in this country a woman whose daughter went to school and they asked the girl what do you think about homosexuality and she said well if you're asking my opinion i'll tell you that it is evil it's a sin and god will punish people who do that hey now they want to exclude the girl from school for two days. This is happening on our watch. Because they said when the girls gave that answer, there were people in the class who are like that. And they felt offended and threatened by what the girl said. So they called the girl's mom at home and said, your daughter Olivia, this is what she did in school. And we are going to exclude her for two days. The mom said, I thought your school is a faith school. They said, yes, it's a faith school. We should pray for this nation. And it's all over the world. Let us pray. Because me speaking like this, somebody will watch me and say, this guy is homophobic. Good luck to you. Good luck to you. The mother said, my daughter will not go on any e e e e exclusion. She will not go. Send her home. Bring her home. You asked her her opinion. You asked her her opinion. And she told you. You can't handle it. So you are excluding the girl. Amputating these kids in school. Spiritual amputation. Cutting their limbs off. Because we don't pray in our schools anymore. We don't worship in our schools anymore. We don't talk about the Bible anymore. That's why I always say that, listen, we must pray for our generation, the kids that are coming. Because their generation is not going to be easy. Let me round this up. He says, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. 
so that you may be able to prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and in his purpose for you. Transformation will allow the Holy Spirit to work on us. Number one, he will renew us. Number two, he will re-educate us. And number three, he will redirect us. I say that again. Number one, he will renew us. Number two, he will re-educate us. And number three, he will redirect us. I pray that God will use you and I to do great things. And that he will bring us to a place where we'll be able to prove what is that good, wonderful, perfect will of God for all of our lives. Can I please kindly ask you to rise to your feet? Hallelujah. There's a good, perfect, acceptable will of God for all of us, our lives. And this morning, we just want to pray. He says, Peter, you need to be restored, transformed. You change your mind, and I can work with you. I can use you to do great things. As I said, Peter's life is just amazing in the book of Acts. And if you study the book of Acts, like I said, from chapter 1, to chapter number 12. Peter is the dominant guy there. He's the one who goes to Cornelius because Cornelius sends for him. And he goes to the Gentile home. And it's through Peter that the Holy Spirit baptism came upon Gentiles for the first time in the Bible. Oh, what if he had been at sea? What if he had been sailing away fruitlessly toiling and stubbornly still looking for fish that he can't find? But he made up his mind and God used him. Like I said, he raised dead people back to life. At least Dorcas raised Dorcas back to life. Peter, hallelujah. We want to pray that, Lord God, restore me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew your right spirit within me. Help me to pursue your purpose and your plan for me. I'm done with chasing after my own desires. I'm done with chasing after my own plans. This morning, I'm crying out to you, Holy Spirit, just as you worked in Peter's life and transformed him and used him, made him a great evangelist, one who impacted his nation and the nations of the world today. Lord, you can use me. Lift up your voice this morning with me. In your own quiet way, lift up your voice. But pray in the name of Jesus that Lord, the Bible says that he knows the plans he has for us. That they are good plans, not of evil, to give us a future and a hope. That's what Jeremiah says to us. And Father, this morning we are praying as a people that you have a good plan for our lives. You have a perfect plan for our lives. Much better than what we have been doing and where we are. Much better than Simon Peter could ever have achieved on the high seas of life. Something much more significant. Something much more enduring. Something much more beneficial to his generation. And Lord, this morning I'm praying in the name of Jesus that use me. Use me, O God. Help me, O God, to navigate my way out in the name of Jesus, of the places where I should not be, of the environment where I should not be, in the name of Jesus. Help me, O God, to be all that I was born to be. Use me for your own glory in the name of Jesus. Use me, O God, renew my spirit. Lord, redirect me, re-educate me. Give me a new understanding of your word in the name of Jesus. Open my eyes to the possibilities that are available in Christ. We are praying for this house, O oh God, that you will raise up men and women who know your agenda for them. Men and women who are touched by the fire of God. Men and women who are committed to the work of ministry. In the name of Jesus. In our communities, in our workplaces. People who can take the word of God. To our schools. To our offices. 
uh, to the places where we occupy, uh, my God, to the places where we work. Uh, use us, oh God, in our communities. Uh, raise up leaders in our communities, oh God. Uh, raise us up as leaders, my God, uh, who can impact our generation. Uh, this morning I pray against any spirit of despair, anything that brings distress, anything that causes us to settle for less, anything that causes us to take the things that are not ours. In the name of Jesus, we are saying, Use us, O God, as you turn Peter's life around. We pray, my God, take away every guilt, take away every shame, every cloud of guilt that is hanging over our lives, every cloud of worry, doubt, anxiety, fear that is lurking around our lives in the name of Jesus you, and use us, O oh God, for your glory in Jesus' mighty name. Eternal God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord. you have a good and a perfect plan for all of us. A good, acceptable, perfect will of God. But this morning we are asking, O oh God, that you will help us to be transformed. It will take your grace. It will take your strength. Help us to renew our minds. Even as you worked on Peter and reformed him and transformed him in the process. So that Peter became all that he was born to be. This morning I ask oh God that let us be a people who follow purpose. Let us be a people who will seek to identify the reason why we are here. Help us to use our years and our time on earth to fulfill your purpose. Because at the end of the day it shall not be by how much we have achieved on our own. But what we have done in terms of obeying your will obeying your purpose, fulfilling your purpose in our lives, so that when we stand before you, we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, Lord, I pray for this house. Raise up young men and women who are passionate for your purposes. Raise up men and women who want to stand for the things of the kingdom. Use us for your glory. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today we have, um, I believe we have a youth service. So U7 starts, um, it's 12 o'clock now. I think U7 starts at 1 o'clock. So please don't be in a hurry to go hang around and be part of the youth service. Um, invite your friends, invite your neighbors. Something good is happening here, hallelujah. Um, they have a, a wonderful concert coming up as well, hallelujah, on the 30th, is it? On the 30th of April, wonderful concert. I, I'll be here because I won't be part of it. I don't know why they didn't add us the full service, but you know we need to we need to accept that. Maybe next time the lady will be here for the full service and also for the youth. But this one will be for the youth service. It's going to be a wonderful concert. Please make sure you 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 are here to be part of it. Okay, we're going to take our tithe and we're going to take our offering. A tithe is a ten percent of all that God blesses us with, and God gives us an opportunity to work with Him and to be a blessing to the kingdom. Please. If you are here and you brought your tithe, kindly come forward. We want to receive it. Uh, our PDQ machine is still not working. Um, we've ordered a new one, but it seems to be taking forever. So please, um, if you can, you'll see a number on the screen or details on the screen by which you can, you can, you can um, give into our account. You can give um, directly into the account. Um, or there's a cash machine um, at the station. You can use that if you so wish. But whatever you do, be a blessing to the house of God. Anyone here who came with your tithe, please come forward. If there's anyone here, if there's no one here, then it will just be me. Anybody here? If you give your tithe by standing order, please come. I just want to join. I have a duty from my bishop to pronounce a blessing over those who come. If you are here, please come. You don't have it in your hand, but you, you, you give it into the account. Please come. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Oscar. Please come closer. Father, we lift up our tithe in obedience to your will. We thank you that you are a faithful God. You know how to provide for your children. And we will not be poorer because we give to the work of the kingdom. We will not go without food or the blessings of life because we obeyed your word. But contrary to that, we know that when we give, you will cause men to give back to us. A good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Will you cause men to give to us? For with the same measure we gave, it shall be measured back to us. We thank you for the tithe. We bless you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. God bless you. 
I don't know why I hear this song in my spirit. All things are possible. When you come, can you, can you play that song for me? When we call on his name, all things, please rise to your feet. All things are possible in Jesus' name. Rise to your feet. Lift up your offering. Lift it up. Father, we thank you. We have lifted up our offering to you. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you receive this and use it for the work of the kingdom. I pray that you bless your people, bless the works of our hands. Open doors for us in this house. Raise up the millionaires in this house. Men and women of substance. Men and women who handle wealth, who can support the work and be a blessing to their generation. We thank you, we bless you, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us welcome living praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Shall we rise up on our feet because we're coming to give to the Lord. And let's come to give with a smile. Amen. Amen. Tell the person next to you, smile. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father, we are so thankful for the grace to give. And we ask, oh God, that you receive the seed and bless it for your glory. In Jesus' name, bless your people. Bless the work of our hands. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. We just want to quickly acknowledge those who celebrated their birthdays in the course of the week. So please, let's put our hands together for Mr. George Akuno. Put your hands together for Uncle George. <laughs> Hallelujah. George, please come. Please come join us. And Janelle, Janelle Boatin, is Janelle here? Put your hands together for Janelle. Hallelujah. Elion. Mighty man. Where's Elion? Hallelujah. Elliot, where's the cake? Uh, you've eaten all of it, I can tell. Uh, no cake for pasta. Hallelujah. Any other person who celebrated their birthdays, maybe we haven't got you on our system. Please stretch your hands towards them. Hallelujah. In this house, we celebrate life. Hallelujah. Stretch your hands towards them. Pronounce a blessing over them. We thank God for the lives of Elion, for Janelle, and for Mr. Akono, hallelujah. It has been by the grace of God, hallelujah. George was telling me the challenges he went through recently. And I said, this man, you are a survivor, you are a fighter, hallelujah. But today you are here celebrating your birthday. We want to thank God. Please stretch your hands towards them. Don't be silent. Open your mouth. Just offer some prayer of thanksgiving. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. You are good and your mercy endures forever. You have taught us in every situation we go through to be thankful. For David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. The humble will hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. This morning we exalt your name together. On behalf of Janelle, on behalf of Mr. Akuno, and on behalf of mighty man, we lift my God and Leon before the throne of grace. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you will use them for your glory. Let their years be years of grace and glory in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that they will find fulfillment in life. You will give them, my God, your purpose and your plan. And it shall be so clear to them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask, O oh God, that let this year be a year of more grace. Let your hand rest upon them. Bless them in everything they do. Wherever they go, let your hand be upon them. Let all know that these ones are called by your name. We thank you, we bless you, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us sing happy birthday to them. Hallelujah. Happy birthday to you all. God bless you. Enjoy your day. God bless you. Hallelujah. Um, it's Angela. We are here. Angela, please come. You remember when we had um, we had um, Dr. Angela Banks here and we also had um, Dr. Sonia Lowe and um, I've been speaking with them um, now and again. Should be speaking to them more actually than I've done. But today, Angela is here to um, carry on from where we left off. There's so many proposals that have come up and I just wanted to give you just a brief idea of the things that we're planning to do and to encourage you also to be part of what it is that we are doing. So let us welcome Angela. Hallelujah. Um, just to carry off from what our daddy said, and to my knowledge, I believe the books that uh, we ordered with Dr. Sonia are already in. And for those that paid with her while she was here, um, she's personally signed it for you so you can um, see me or... Oh, okay. Okay, so I'll be at the back and uh, you can see me for your books. Amen. 
So I'm here to um, follow up with uh, the partnership that Dr. A and Dr. Sonia um, proposed uh, with Living Springs and um, just to go over what is happening moving forward. So at the moment, uh, Sister Bola will be assisting me when I'm not here. Your go-to person will be Sister Bola um, for those that showed interest back then. And um, just to go over what the benefits are for the partnership is to give Living Springs as the London hub access to global community, access to a global community of leaders to build a spiritual foundation and kingdom focused leaders and to have the ability to merge both the church and the marketplace together and to have a leadership development, empowerment and promotion. And it comes as a partnership with Excellence Leadership University, which is with Dr. A and SGLU, which is Strategic Growth Leadership Bible um, University with Dr. Sonia, and that is a degree, uh, a degree um, for the degree courses. And with these partnerships, um, we've already done the step one and step two with um, Daddy, and as I said, Bula is my um, liaison. And the step three is for those that uh, showed um, interest, you know, with each of the courses that they wanted to partake in to, I'll be at the back with uh, a form that you can register your name because what we are doing is to gather everyone together and then we will choose a lunch date for um, Living Springs, hallelujah. And um, so that is uh, the first part of it. And if you go on to um, excellenceinc.org, it shows you the list of the programs that we have and there are two options um, which Dr. A, there are other um, programs on there, but the two main ones that Dr. A uh, proposed is the Power Purpose Life Program, which has um, four courses for any one of us that showed interest back in the London Leadership Program. If you want to be an author, if you want to be a speaker, if you want to be a life coach, and if you want to be an entrepreneur as well, the Power purpose life program incorporates all these in in one bundle and it gives you the chance to incorporate your beliefs your spiritual beliefs with your professional um, skills into the marketplace and the benefits that I wanted to stress on with this power purpose life program when you become an author I believe Dr. Sonia said that in in everyone's life there is there are two books that you at least must write, and one is a book about your life, and one, you know, you can choose the other one, be it in your profession or um, whatever it may be. But some of the benefits of being an author is to share your experiences with other people. And when you share your experiences, the, the, the benefits of being an author, you grow your platform. You grow your platform, you can, you know, build up a business around being an author. You can build up leadership training courses that you can train other people coming up behind you that may have gone through um, similar situations that you wrote about, or you know, just um, train and lead people in that respect. You can also become a trained speaker, public speaker, where you, you become a keynote speaker to other people's programs or you have your own program where you can speak and share your experiences um, with the world. And also um, the business side of it, being an entrepreneur, you, you become um, a part of Dr. A's uh, leadership uh, team, which is what we are trying to do with London um, Hub, is to train up leaders within um, Living Springs so that, you know, when the church has any events or when we are witnessing to the world, we, we go along with our leaders. Amen. Amen. And all these courses uh, can be found on the land, um, Excellence Inc. Or Excellence Inc. Inc. org online. And I'll be liaising with um, Sister Bola for those that will put down their names 
to help them to facilitate with their registration and everything. And once we've got everyone together, we can decide on a lunch date where we will present um, the people, the participants, and then we can take it from there. And the second option also is a power leaders, uh, global power leadership certification program. And it's also um, ideal for emerging leaders seeking to lead from the front in their careers, in their businesses, and in their communities. So there are so many benefits that we'll be going through um, once everyone comes together. There are so many benefits that you can, you know, um, get from being a part of this program. And I believe with um, Dr. Sonia's degree programs, uh, they will be dealing with the registration and everything because it's more advanced, it's a degree course. So um, I believe that is everything else, uh, everything that I have to say. Thank you. Okay, if, if you're here, please, um, Diana Taylor, Bola, Sister Bola, Fred Boatin, <laughs> Matilda, Antonio, okay, Edward Ofori Dodu, uh, or Marian, no, Elizabeth Dasho, and Joseph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So please, this is something extra, okay? Um, you cannot just be church as usual. And you heard them when they came. This leadership program, I'm going to go on it because there, there, there's more to learn. Hallelujah. So if you want to get into the leadership program, when they came, some of you are in the media, some of you are in government, some of you are, you know, in all other sectors. And you want to be a community leader. It means you can carry the gospel to your community. That's what the world needs today. If you are a nurse, you need to be able to have the ability to go to your workplace and in the right way, communicate with people and engage them. Hallelujah. Be a leader in your community, wherever you are working. You can be effective if you go through this, product, this, uh, this process of education. And it gives you more confidence to be able to go out there and to be able to be a witness and do so in style. Hallelujah. And also... Um, um, it's not that long. It's only for about four weeks and you've gone through the course, but then it's progressive. So you move on from there to something else and it will do you a world of good. Also, Dr. Sonia Lowe's one is another amazing opportunity for anybody who wants to carry on, go back to school. It's, it's, uh, it's a course you can do online and you can do a degree course. You can do PhD course online and it's so, it's so, it's so very easy and it's affordable. Um, I've spoken to them and they are willing to give us scholarships and even some discounts. So with everything that Angela has said, they've been generous enough to give us certain discounts. Go and make it easy for us because it's not about the money. They want to promote um, all of us. They want to help us to get to a higher level. So please, if you, you're thinking of going back to school, um, you can Google it when you go home. It's S-G-L-U, Strategic, Stra Strategic Growth Leaders Bible University. Fantastic. When you check it, you, you see that this is not, you know, a wishy-washy thing. It's a beautiful thing, very well organized, and um, I'm sure you love it. But first, go online. Again, go to excellenceincorporated.org, excellenceinc.org. Check for yourself. See what they are offering. And they really want to be a blessing to us. They love us in this house, and they want to do, they want to partner with us. Hallelujah. So please, um, and go check it for yourself, and then let's make some 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 life changing decisions for all of us. Amen. We are done. Uh, announcements, please. If you have any announcements, no. Okay, please. We have yes, sir. Atlanta. Um, please. Um, in July, we're going by the grace of God. So please, if you haven't given your name to Minister Telfer, give your name to him. Um, I'll start working on it. Hopefully next week um, to contact the embassy to see. You know whatever we need to present for those of you who need visas so please if you need a visa um, give your name to minister Telfer and we'll let you know what comes out of it amen also on the 27th and the 28th and then on the 30th we have a rise conference with 
Reverend Obin. Um, he, he's here, but he had to dash over to um, Amsterdam. But he's going to be here um, for, that, for that program. It's going to be amazing. And I'm looking forward to it because I know God has a message for his people. So please, in your calendars, make a note of it. On the 27th, it's going to be on a Thursday from 7 to 9. Friday, also 28th from 7 to 9. And then on Sunday, it's going to be our regular time of service from 10 in the morning to half past 12. Is there any other thing that I've left out, Mr. Boati? Anything else? Rise to your feet. We are done, please. Hallelujah. Can you hold somebody's hand? We are, we are, we are family. We are one. Hallelujah. And I don't know why I keep doing this, but I want you to do it again. Just pray for the person whose hand you're holding. Speak into their lives. Pray that this week will be a, a wonderful week, a week of blessing, a week of God's favor. The hand of God will rest upon them. They will be blessed in everything they do. They will not miss their mark in the name of Jesus. They will not be victims of any enemy's attack in the name of Jesus. Hide them under the covering of the blood. Speak over their lives in the name of Jesus. Make a declaration in the name of Jesus that only goodness and mercy shall follow them all the days of their lives. Say something good to them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. The Bible says how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It lies the dew that is on Mount Hermon that falls upon Mount Zion. The Bible says that there, the Lord has commanded the blessing. It is like the oil that is upon the head of Aaron, running down his head, his beard, down the fringes of his garments to his feet. For in that place, God has commanded the blessing. Lord, you have commanded a blessing wherever there is unity. And so we ask oh God that join us together, knit our hearts together. Make us one. Help us to love one another. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to walk in love, for God is love. For those that walk in love show that they know God. But if a man does not walk in love, he does not know God. Help us to demonstrate to one another that we know God. And Father, as your people go, I pray over them that may Almighty God bless you and keep you. And may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Jehovah lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. I pray the covering of the blood over you even as the blood was upon the doorpost and the lintels of the children of Israel, so that the angel of death passed over. May every evil pass over you this week and for the rest of your life because of the speakings of the blood. May the Passover blood, who is Christ, speak on your behalf in the name of Jesus. Almighty God, frustrate the works of your enemies. Almighty God, deny them access into your life. And may Jehovah God be a blessing over you and your household. We thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us share the grace together. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Favor. Favor goes before us. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Please, you service at one. Be here. God bless you. Keep up to date with all things Living Springs, you can visit our website at livingspringsinternational.org. 
follow us on Facebook at Living Springs Church London and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Living Springs International Church. We hope you have a blessed week.